when resentment is present in a marriage, y'all, it creates a vulnerability that will drag you away so that all Satan has to do is entice you. I'm so grateful for the word and for the opportunity to be here. Before I start, can I just be honest? I want to be transparent with you all because the word that the Lord gave me today requires a level of vulnerability that I pray will be a blessing to you. So eight years ago, I was on the cusp of my 33rd birthday. And uh, I was in a season of just heavy travel with work. Uh, I was leading several ministries at church Um, Just a demanding schedule. I was on like half a dozen community boards, and I was just exhausted, y'all. I was exhausted. So as my birthday approached, I told my husband, I said, honey, you know, the the gift I really want for my birthday is to be left alone. I just want to go away to the beach by myself so I can just rest and recuperate, and he agreed to that. And so, you know, I I made my way to my favorite beachfront resort the day before my birthday. I got settled into my room, and and I opened up my sliding glass doors to just take in the beautiful sight of the Atlantic Ocean. I heard the waves crashing against one another, and y'all, I just felt this wave of peace rush over me because I was in my happy place. I had booked a 10-hour spa day for my birthday. I mean, I literally was like, hey, what y'all got? Let me get it. Manny, petty, facial, body scrub, massage, whatever y'all got, I want it. I booked a 10-hour spa day for my birthday. And so the night before my birthday, I laid down. I was in a state of peace. And then my alarm went off, and I woke up in the morning of my birthday, and I grabbed my cell phone, and I opened it up, and I had a bunch of text messages from people wishing me happy birthday. I had voice calls from people, and I went on Facebook. I saw a bunch of comments from people wishing me a happy birthday. I went into my DMs. People were wishing me a happy birthday. But there was, there was one name that was conspicuously absent from the sea of well-wishers, and that was my husband. But I was like, it was early. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. So I was like, you know what? He's probably dealing with the kids, getting them ready for school. So I'm not going to think too much of it. So I made my way to the spa. I put my things in the locker. And I went and I had about two or three hours worth of services. And so around lunchtime, I go to the locker. I take a break. I take my phone out. And I check my phone. And I see even more texts from people wishing me a happy birthday. I go on Facebook. There's even more comments wishing me a happy birthday. There's even more DMs wishing me a happy birthday. But in the sea of well wishes, there was one name that was missing. And that was my husband. But I figured, you know what? Hey, It's still early in the day. He's probably busy. He's a pastor. He's probably tending to the needs of the sheep. So I'm not going to think too much of it. So I put my phone back in the locker and I go back to have another four or five hours worth of services. I get back to my locker. It's about six o'clock in the evening. I pull out my cell phone, I make my way back to my room, and I open up my apps, I open up my texts, there's even more happy birthdays, just this sea of happy birthday messages, and I open up my Facebook app, and I see all these comments from people, and they're saying happy birthday, happy birthday. I open up my private messages, and I see even more happy birthday messages, and I'm sitting there thinking, huh, I haven't heard from my husband all day. Y'all, something started to churn on the inside of me. But I decided that what I would do is I would just start responding to messages. So I sat down on my bed and I started responding to the text messages. Then I moved over to the comments on Facebook. And then I went to my DMs. And as I was responding to the messages in my DM, I saw a name that I hadn't seen since before I got married. It was the name of my ex-boyfriend. And he was wishing me a happy birthday and saying, you know, we should catch up. It's been too long. When I saw his name in my DMs, 
wishing me a happy birthday when my husband had not reached out to me all day, something clicked inside of me. And so I decided that I was gonna give him a call. So I, I call my husband. It rings once and goes to voicemail. Huh. I call him back. It rings once, goes to voicemail. So I know that he's sending me to voicemail. And so as this happens, I'm getting more and more worked up. So I call him back again. He answers the phone and says, hey, what is it? What is it? I'm in Bible study. I put on my meek, mild, pastor's wife voice. And I said, step out right now. I hear him say to the people, hey, I, I, I got to take this call. Give me, just give me a minute. So he steps outside. And I say to him, why haven't I heard from you all day? And he says, well, it's just been a busy day. I just had a lot going on, and I, just, I guess I just didn't think about it. I had a lot of errands to run. I said, is that right? I said, have you called or texted anybody today? He said, well, yeah, I mean, I had to return some calls and, you know, I had to set up some, some, some services at the house and things. I said, okay, so help me understand. I know y'all don't understand this, but so help me understand. How did you have time to call and text everybody else, but you didn't have time to contact your wife on her birthday? Y'all, I could literally hear the wheels turning in his brain as he remembered that he forgot it was my birthday. But before he could even explain, I hung up the phone. I was so angry. I was so hurt, I felt so much resentment start to build inside of me until a spirit of discernment made me go, hmm, how is it that a man I have not talked to since before I got married just happened to reach out in the exact moment when I was in a state of emotional weakness and vulnerability. How is it that a man who I wasn't even Facebook friends with just happened to remember my birthday on the day that my husband forgot? You know, I thank God for the Holy Spirit because see, the Holy Spirit will give you a sense of discomfort when something seems okay, but there's something wrong with it. And in that moment, what I realized, y'all, is that Satan isn't omniscient, but he is strategic. The spirit of discernment saved me from allowing that emotional vulnerability to become the bridge over which my ex could have re-entered my life. Which is why for whoever needs this message today, I'm going to teach from the subject, burn it all. Burn it all. I'm gonna be in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 15 and one. The Bible says in this story that the prophet Samuel said to King Saul, I am the one, the Lord that sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy 
all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Skipping down to verse 7, the Bible goes on to say that Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur near the eastern border of Egypt. He took King Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with a sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. You know, for the longest time, I could not understand how a God of love and mercy and grace and compassion could tell Saul to slaughter innocent people? How could my heavenly father, who is a God of love, command for an entire population of people to be obliterated? It was that lack of understanding that caused me to ask the question, my God, what happened? Well, I thank God because back in the book of Exodus chapter 17 and 1, the Bible tells us that after the children of Israel were freed from their bondage in Egypt, that the whole Israelite community had set out from the desert of sin. They were traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and they said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. You have to realize that at this point in Scripture, by the time the Israelites made it to Rephidim, they were tired, they were hungry, they were thirsty. They started to to complain. They were frustrated. They were overwhelmed. They started to grumble against Moses. As a matter of fact, they were in such a state of emotional and psychological vulnerability that they had started to romanticize the place that God had delivered them from. They started to say, we should go back to that place because that's where we had water. That's where we had food. They had gotten to a place where they were so weak and they were so vulnerable that they were so tired that they started to think that it would have been better for them to stay in their bondage. And it was in that state of vulnerability that the Bible tells us in verse 8 that the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. The Amalekites attacked the Israelites when they were in a heightened state of vulnerability. And this is why God said to Moses in Deuteronomy 25 and 19, when the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you in the land he is giving you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. You're wondering, what does this Bible lesson have to do with my marriage? What does this Bible lesson have to do with being on cloud nine? What does this Bible lesson have to do with unity in my marriage, brothers and sisters? Everything. Because some of you have found yourselves on a repeated losing side of an attack because of the vulnerabilities in your heart and the vulnerability in your mind and what you think is that that other person that other situation is sent there to be a blessing to you but what you don't understand is that they are simply an Amalekite by another name that is simply exploiting your weaknesses and exploiting your vulnerabilities and so I came here this morning to tell you as God said to Moses and Saul do not forget burn it all burn it all you see, Amalekites exploit weaknesses. They thrive on vulnerabilities. And one of the most dangerous 
vulnerabilities in a marriage is resentment. The reason why it's a vulnerability is because resentment is like hydrochloric acid to a marriage. It weakens your ability to resist temptation because what resentment does is it amplifies your desire for whatever it is that your spouse is not meeting. And so what happens is all Satan has to do is just create an occasion to present you with the opportunity of the thing that your spouse is not doing and you will fall into temptation. But let me give you a biblical definition of temptation because see, sometimes we say that we're tempted by something just because it's, it's a thing that's presented to us. Listen, if you do not like chocolate cake, if I put a piece of chocolate cake in front of you, that's not going to tempt you. If you do not care about a woman's body shape, if a woman walks in here with a tight dress on, that is not going to tempt you. But let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says in James chapter 1 and 14 that each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. When resentment is present in a marriage, y'all, it creates a vulnerability that will drag you away so that all Satan has to do is entice you. Which is why I want to give you two key insights out of this story of the Amalekites so that you can protect and preserve the unity of your marriage. The first insight I need you to understand is that you are not tripping and falling into sin. You are tripping and falling into traps. Hear me. The Amalekites did not just happen upon the Israelites. They did not just stumble upon the Israelites. No, they had been following them. They had been tracking them. They had been waiting for the moment of optimal vulnerability when their attack would be as lethal as possible. And this is why I believe God sent me here today to tell you that you have to be very intentional about pruning the relationships connected to you. If there are people in your life, when you start to complain about your marriage, Instead of encouraging you and praying for you, they say things like, oh yeah, I wouldn't take that. If I was you, I would leave that. You have an Amalekite among you. If they're the type of person who even worse will say, I'll do a better job, you have an Amalekite among you. Hear me, my brothers and sisters. The devil is not after your car. He's not after your house. He's not even after your lights. We blame the devil for all of that stuff, but I promise you, if you just pay your bills, you will retain authority over all of that. The devil isn't after your stuff, but you know what he is after? Your witness. Because there are people who look to you and your marriage as a beacon of hope for what is possible for theirs. And so he will seize on any and every vulnerability that you present to him to try to provide an occasion to entice you. I think about Matthew 4 and 2. The Bible tells us that when Jesus was in the wilderness, it says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I find it curious that Satan didn't come to him on day one. Day five, 10, 20, he waited until the son of God, who was also the son of man, was completely vulnerable in his flesh to a point where the only power he had to withstand against temptation was the spirit on the inside of him. And he came to him at that very moment and said, I know you're hungry. If you're the son of God, let me see you make these stones bread. You see, what I know to be true is that the reason why my ex reached out to me at that very moment is because Satan does have a power of influence to plant a seed 
to recognize when you are in a state of optimal vulnerability, to plant a seed for that Amalekite to try to slither on in. But you see, what the devil didn't count on is that I love Jesus for real. I know God for real. And so when the enemy tried to show up and he tried to make a fool of me in my marriage, I said, oh no, player, it's not going down like that. See, the thing is you will not get the glory out of my marriage. You will not get the glory. Some of us in here have to make a commitment that we will be as holy in private as we are in public because if you are holy in private I promise you that you will not give the enemy not a nanometer of ground in your life this is why we have to burn it all because what the devil means to trap you God is going to use to train you but you have to be observant. The enemy, he walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The thing about lions is they study their prey. They don't just go run into a field of antelope. They study them to see where's the weakest, which one is the slowest, which one is isolated, which one is not in community. And some of us in this room right now, we are isolated and we're not in community. We're struggling in our marriage, but we don't want other people in our business. And because we don't want other people in our business, we are making ourselves vulnerable to the attacks of Amalekites. But I came here today to prophetically declare that it ends today. We are going to crucify pride. We're going to crucify ego. We are going to allow the humility of the Holy Spirit to get us into community where we can be accountable. I declare prophetically to everybody in this room and everybody watching online that it ends today. Satan will not get any glory from the demise of a marriage connected to this ministry. The second insight I need you to understand is that the good things we keep in our heart become the things that Amalekites return for. The good stuff, the stuff we don't want to let go of, that becomes what Amalekites return for. A girlfriend of mine spent five years trying to break up with a man who was a serial cheater. You see, she made the mistake of being so in love with him that she allowed him to move in with her. So he moved in with her and he started to cheat on her over and over and over. And what she would do is every time she would find out he was cheating on her, she would kick him out and she would tell him to take all his stuff with him. But then inevitably, a couple of weeks later, he would reach out because he forgot something. And so he would have to stop back by the house. And while he was there, he would find a way to say something sweet. He would find a way to just gently caress her elbow and remind her of the good days the good times and she would keep taking him back over and over and then on the last time that he cheated on her it was so bad that he didn't just return for his stuff he returned with an engagement ring and proposed and do you know she said yes it's because the good stuff is what Amalekites return for what does this look like some of us won't get rid of that song that reminds us of our ex because we say, but it sounds good. Some of us have people in our DMs that are constantly complimenting us and sending the heart eyes emojis and instead of blocking them, we say, but their compliments feel good. For others of us, we're struggling with addictions and our spouse is saying, you gotta get rid of that alcohol. You gotta stop hanging out with those people. And we say, but it feels good. See, Saul thought that he was being smart by keeping the good stuff, but he didn't realize that it was the good stuff that was making him weak. Some of us need to burn some memories to ashes. Some of us need to burn some relationships to ashes. Some of us may even need to burn some social media apps to ashes. There are people that we need to block. We need to delete. There's some music we need to throw away. There's some memories that we need to burn to ashes. I don't know who this message is for this morning, but God sent me here today to tell you, if you want to experience 
the power of a godly marriage, you have to first be willing to obey God, especially in the things that hurt. The things that you don't want to get rid of because they've become your crutch. They've become the thing that you run to when you're feeling emotionally vulnerable and weak. And God is saying, instead of running to a person or a thing, I need you to run to me. Because his grace is sufficient. You see, what I came to realize is that God wasn't being mean when he told Saul to burn it all. He was being wise. Anybody who will prey on your vulnerability does not deserve access to you. I don't care how cute they are. I don't care how handsome they are. I don't care if they are a family member. I don't care how close they may seem to you. Anybody who is willing to use your emotional vulnerability to drive a wedge between you and your spouse, they are an Amalekite, plain and simple. Plain and simple. And God is saying, I need you to burn it all today. But you know what happens when you burn something? You get ashes. The promise that I want to leave you with today is that if you are willing to honor God by utterly destroying, burning to ashes, that thing that has created a vulnerability in your life, God makes a promise. In Isaiah 61, the word of God tells us that God will give you a crown of beauty instead of ashes. He will give you the joy instead of mourning. He will give you a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. God will make your marriage beautiful if you are willing to honor him with your decisions. It ends today. It ends today. And you already know exactly what I'm talking about. God will bless your marriage when you develop the type of hunger and thirst for God that is more consumed with his righteousness than what feels good in the moment. My brothers and sisters, burn it all. Not just when it hurts, but especially when it hurts. Father, as we stand in this place, you know what we are wrestling with, God. You know what we have turned to, God. You know what we have allowed to have our hearts and our minds instead of our spouses, God. But we recognize these attacks for what they are. They are strategic attacks that the enemy is waging on our marriage in an attempt to discredit what you have decided to do through our marriage, but it ends today. We will not allow Satan to get glory through anything that happens in our marriage. We surrender it to you today, God. Whatever it is that you're calling us, to burn we lay it on the altar right now not tomorrow not next week not next month God it ends today I pray for you to give your sons and daughters the grace to obey you because when we leave this conference the Amalekites are going to be waiting on the outside but what they don't understand is that from this day forward we will destroy it all we will burn it all so that you will get the glory out of our marriage if that was your declaration today, I need you to say amen and give God praise. God bless you. God bless you.